We're with Antonio Torral. Antonio, is that how I pronounce your name? Is that correct? That's correct. Yes. Right. Where are Anthony. you, Antonio? What What do you do, Antonio? What's your job? Yeah. So right now I work as a associate professor in language technology at the University of uh, Groningen in the north of the Netherlands. Okay. Now. I suspect you're not a citizen of the Netherlands, Antonio. Is that right? I'm not a citizen of the Netherlands, no. I come <laughs> from uh, originally from uh, the east of uh, Spain, a city called Alacant or Alicante in the land of Valencia. But I've moved okay. around since quite a bit. Okay. So your first language is Spanish or... or... My Catalan. first language or native language is Spanish and uh, Catalan uh, learned at school. Okay. Yeah. And t just tell us about your, your current work. What, what, what do you do? Right. Yeah. So I teach in uh, different uh, programs in this uh, at the University of Groningen. So our bachelor, uh, the bachelor and the master in my department is in information science. Uh, that's official title, but there is a lot of uh, computational linguistics or natural language processing. Then I teach in the master of uh, in digital humanities and in the master in uh, translation. So okay, it's, uh, I'm in the faculty of arts. So it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, yeah, it's a bit of a mix of, uh, you know, translation and uh, computational skills as well. So, what's so your my background? department, yeah, so my, sorry, my field, computational linguistics, it's a bit funny in some universities, tends to be in a school of computing and in other universities is in faculty of arts, you know, because it has these two components, uh, language and computer science. My background so is my... Now, would yeah, you call you a computational linguist or translation studies person or both? I'd say I've been in um, um, traveling from computer science into translation or translation technology, I should say. Yes. Okay. So my degree was in uh, computer science. And then when I finished it, uh, there was an opening for a PhD in computation, computational linguistics. So that brought me a bit more, a bit of linguistics into me. Halfway, I moved to, sorry. Alicante. Yeah, half, but that's in, like yeah. and that group of people, or that's Valencia? Is no, that's Alicante as well. Uh, so so there, well, there was a group doing machine translation. And there is another group uh, doing computational linguistics, and I was in the computational linguistics group. Ah, okay. So doing more like a name entity recognition, these kind of things. Right. Okay. Halfway through my PhD, I moved to Italy, to the in Instituto di Linguistica Computazionale, which has more of a humanistic background. So that's, I think, where my, my yeah. journey well, continued. Where is that in Italy? That's in Pisa. Okay, all right. Yeah. So, so you went from, from Alicante to Italy you're in, in your yeah. 20s? So from, from a group that was the, doing computational linguistics with a computer science background to another that was doing it with a linguistics background, right? So okay. I'm, I met other types of uh, people. Uh, towards the end of it, I was, you mentioned the Mikel Forcada, so I always uh, felt a bit puzzled, a bit like how they do translation. So I was, you know, I had there uh, a lot of curiosity. So when I was done with my PhD, I applied to do a postdoc in machine translation in Dublin. I moved there and then uh, Mikel was doing a sabbatical. So that's where I met him. Not really in oh, my own wow. town. This is Dublin <laughs> University? Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so I spent there a few years. Well, for research on translation technology. So, so yeah. what, what, uh, what were you looking at then in the postdoc? In my postdoc, I was looking at um, uh, resources. So um, because, you know, uh, it was the statistical MT days. So you need uh, resources like a corpora. So we were looking at uh, what 
kind of data we can get from the internet to improve the systems? Can we find monolingual data? Can we find parallel data for different textual domains uh, okay. to improve the systems? So we had a project called Abu Matran. That was when uh, Croatia joined the EU. And the idea was, can we crawl data to give uh, more resources to this new official language and other languages of uh, the Balkans? That's quite a then, story. Yeah, that's okay, so, uh, really? 10, year, 10 years ago, yes. Yeah. So where did you go? Then the I had, postdoc? right, uh, towards the end of my postdoc, because I was acquiring data, right? And um, that's 10 years ago, and an ebook fell on my hands. Um, and I was, uh, it's because I was reading a paper book and the next one in the series uh, was not on paper and uh, there was an ebook and I could find it. So I started reading there and then I made a connection. Like I've been crawling data from the web and now if we look at ebooks at fiction, we have the data ebooks. So, you know, I, I started uh, to look at, can we build parallel data for fiction? And you know, can we build a system for fiction and what it will do? And so it was driven out of curiosity. Then uh, most people around were thinking this is leading nowhere. But uh, my boss at the time, Andy Way, said, "Yeah, let's explore this. You know, let's see what happens." Uh, so this is at least at in Dublin, and you were doing the yeah. This is still in Dublin, just before I left. The heretical and work. this. <laughs> Yeah, then I think this uh, continued my journey because through this, of course, first I build the systems, but then I started working with uh, uh, literary translators that were curious about this. Uh, of course, it, en it, it ended up that this uh, is rather problematic, you know, because of uh, limits creativity and so on. But, you know, I had to, I interviewed them. Uh, I got exposed to the this world of uh, literary translation, uh, book editors, uh, publishing houses, and so on. So I got more and more interested in the limits of technology and the, let's say, the middle point between, let's say, translation technology, machine translation and translation studies. Yep. Just to try to explain this, as I understand it, you got previous translations of Agatha Christie, right? Into Catalan or Spanish? I can't remember Catalan, I think. Right? The first experiment we did was still statistical MT and that was Spanish to Catalan. And our idea was, well, these are two closely related languages so maybe most things are just going to transfer at the lexical level, you know, so if you have a metaphor, the metaphor, it will probably uh, be said in exactly the same way because they're two closely related languages uh, and, this and is for culturally as well. For, for literature? Sorry? You were doing Yeah, this was for uh, Ruiz Zafon. That was the first work. So All we right. had, Good. there is a series with three, three novels. So we yeah. train or fine tune the system with the first two. And then looked at how, what can it do with the third one? So that should work, I reckon. Did it work? Uh, yes. So I don't remember the figure, but it was like some percentage uh, readers could not tell the difference. I don't okay. remember what. I think what I, I, I couldn't say because I don't remember. Yeah, but, but I mean, it was a high percentage. Do... Readers couldn't tell the difference, right? So that's an easy one. And mm -hmm. then. The, the, you you did something with English Catalan with Agatha Christie or um, my memory is failing yeah. me. So we did English Catalan and here uh, because fiction is something quite broad, right? So we decided to have a test set of uh, multiple books. So we had 12 and the idea was to have very different things. So from um, the last Harry Potter to um, Ulysses by James Joyce, right? Okay. And then we see that uh, indeed, you know, it, it really fiction is, of course, it's uh, very clear, right? It's actually very broad. And of course, if you train your system with six Harry Potters, number seven, you can do uh, quite a good job. But Ulysses, the machine doesn't know what to do with it, of course. Thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Tell me about your research from so 
Did you go straight from Dublin to to the Netherlands, or was it a yes. roundabout? Yeah. yeah, yeah, I went directly. So now I moved um, to um, again a, a faculty of arts. So it's a different kind of uh, you know environment, which Do gives you... me the chance, for example, to teach in the translation program. Right. Your your research has has pre stayed pretty much on the use of um automation for literary texts i think is that right uh has continuing that I'm, I'm more now if, looking at sorry are you aware that that might upset some people that you're going against the literary ideology of human creativity or something like that mm. It could at first sight, but I think once you get to know more about it, I think actually should be the opposite, because we are looking. I think, I think it's it, to me it's not a valid answer to say uh, this is better be ignored, right? I think okay, we do the you know the perceived wisdom is that machine translation is not going to work, but that's a research question, right? Then is it? Is it going to work? To what extent? What are the consequences? So then we we see, you know, to what extent it works with different kind of fiction. Then we work with translators, and then we see, yes, they're a bit faster, but uh, they don't like it. Um, um, creativity so goes down, right? So it depends if you translate. This is already this is now work with I did with uh, in Anna's uh, Marie Curie project, Anna Gerberov. And then we say, okay, if we translate a short story that is action-packed, uh, readers don't really care and creativity doesn't go down when you post it. If you translate a short story a bit more literary, like Vonnegut, then creativity goes down with post editing and readers notice also. So it also yeah. depends. And uh, so I'm interested uh, since in what are the limitations uh, how it impacts on translators and how it impacts on uh, readers. What are you doing now? What are you studying now, Antonio? Is it still that or you're moving into new um, things? Yeah, so there are a couple of new things. So one related is, uh, can we turn this around? Because I think the problem of using uh, machine translation with uh, creative texts in the way we explore, which is just the way it's commonly used in industry, post-editing, that's problematic, right? But we could look at, can we do it in a different way? Let's let's say, let's uh, do not consider productivity now. Let's uh, let translators translate, but then this is just another resource, machine translation, as is a translation memory or a glossary or a dictionary search. So machine translation is like uh, something you can request additional translations, which I think lends quite well with the new developments in generative AI. So you can ask uh, if you get stuck, for example, you can ask, okay, give me a word that rhymes with that word or a shorter version of this sentence, you know, like another uh, that is, is not for productivity, is for exploration. Yes. Okay, and that's uh, still with literary translation or other kinds as well? I'd say this is uh, relevant for any type of uh, creative kind of text. Okay. Last question, Antonio. What kind of... Sorry, research... the other line. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> the other line I develop is um, to study how translations are different, translations by machines and by humans, by humans mostly... Um, professional translators. So I'm interested in now this um, links to early 90s or 90s work in translation studies on uh, translation is or laws of translation, that translations are different than originals, you know, this kind of thing. So in this framework, how do machine translations differ from human translations? Is the language uh, simpler? Are there We're going uh, back to the less explicit, yeah. you know? Yeah. Are you including AI in that? Yes. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. I bet AI doesn't follow the universals of translation, but I'm betting. I don't know. 
It'd be interesting to find out. Okay. Yeah, we don't know yet. We'll we'll see when we know. We'll see about the bet. They give me some good odds. So I'll, I'll bet. Uh, what kind of research do you think we need in uh, in translation studies? How can I answer that? Because I'm not a scholar in translation studies, right? So I oh, will we, have here. We need any... help. We need help from the outside. I will have an imposter syndrome there, you know, as I described through my journey, uh, originally I'm in computer science, but I can tell you what I find interesting. So if I have to give one example, that's something I, I like, I think uh, could be useful is how can translators use technology for their own benefits or uh, how technology can be used to augment translators, right? It's something, uh, it's a paper from last year by Sharon O'Brien. And yeah. some examples are, so there is also some work, right? Like um, the book by Udale already a few years back uh, shows how uh, things like sketch engine, so corpora can be used to explore you know the the book you are translating in this case was translating books other technologies we might not um, think when we are doing translation like speech so i interviewed recently a translator nuria molines that uses speech to translate so translates speech orally yep. yeah, yeah speech yeah. to text uh, to translate exactly. fiction again and yep. says that this way feels more natural and is closer to translated dialogue than typing. So it's another use of technology. So I think machine translation, generative AI, we also can discover ways uh, to use it um, right. to augment the translator. Antonio, thank you very, very much.